we gratefully acknowledge the indigenous people of the lands we are on today. Even though we are meeting in a virtual space, it is important for us to recognize that we have and continue to benefit from the theft and occupation of this land since even before the United States was formed as a nation. Global Rights for Women is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota with staff throughout Minnesota. And we acknowledge that we are on Dakota and Anishinaabe land. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence that have been inflicted upon indigenous people globally. Additionally, we understand the treatment of indigenous women is a byproduct of colonialism, racism, and misogyny that has perpetuated the continued sexual abuse, disappearance, and murder of indigenous women here in Minnesota and in many places around the world. So please join us now in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harm of the past and present and to consider how you can join the effort to dismantle the continued oppression of indigenous communities and restore justice. And also since people are joining here from around the world, at this time, if you would like to put into the chat the land that you are acknowledging, we would appreciate that. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming to Global Rights for Women's Conversation Series, Valiant Voices. I am Lori Flohog, my pronouns are she and her, and I will be today's moderator. I'm a legal consultant with Global Rights for Women, an organization with a mission to end domestic and sexual violence around the world. Valiant Voices is a conversation series created by Global Rights for Women that features the human rights advocates and survivors who are addressing injustice and disrupting oppressive systems that cause harm. These are the stories of powerful leaders creating change in their communities and around the world. We are live streaming on Facebook today and we welcome your comments there or in the Q&A section on Zoom. After the conversation, we'll be sending out a link with the recording. If you need a certificate of attendance, please contact Sophia Morissette and she'll go ahead and put her email within the chat. Today, we will be talking about identifying abuse in relationships. And we recognize that there may be survivors here with us today. Parts of this conversation may be triggering and we are including resources for people in the United States and internationally in the chat for those who need safety and assistance. I am beyond delighted and pleased to introduce our panelists to you. We'll first start with Mr. Ulester Douglas, who has provided training in 40 states, Europe and the Caribbean to community organizations, universities, corporations and government agencies, and has authored many articles and curricula on family violence and other human rights issues. Welcome, Ulester. Next, we'll go ahead and introduce Mr. Scott Miller. He is the executive director for the Domestic Abuse Intervention Programs. Scott trains internationally on the Duluth model method of organizing, and develops specific community interventions and creates a new curricula for communities working to end violence. Welcome, Scott. In her position as the Director of International Training at Global Rights for Women, Melissa Skaya co-facilitates groups for men who batter and women who use violence. As a qualified expert in the state of Minnesota, Melissa testifies as an expert witness on domestic violence in criminal court cases. Welcome, Melissa. And Lori Stavnes, who is a fifth generation survivor of domestic violence with a professional background in advocacy and co facilitating nonviolence groups for men and women. The personal, societal, and cultural changes that become possible when victims' and survivors' voices are heard inspire and motivate her. 
Thank you for coming, Lori, and thank you all so much for joining us. Let me go ahead and set the context for today's conversation. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and that has led us to have this conversation about the power and control wheel, which our guests today will elaborate on. What we'll be talking about is what domestic abuse looks like from the survivor and advocacy points of view, and how the power and control wheel is an important tool for recognizing what abuse looks like both to individuals, as well as how it is systemically applied to oppress certain populations, including women and girls, people of color, and non-binary people. First, I would like to have our panelists share the history of the power and control wheel and give participants an opportunity to see it on screen. And so Sophia is going to go ahead and share that wheel with us so that we can take a look at it. Is that my cue? So Scott, yes, you <laughs> train extensively on the power and control wheel in your work. I would like you to go ahead and explain the history of the wheel, how it was created, and why it is such an important tool for identifying abusive behavior. Yeah, so um, thank you, Lori. The, um, uh, originally, the, the, the idea was not to create a wheel. The idea that uh, Alan Pence and uh, one of our founders and Coral McDonald uh, had and Michael Paymar were they were trying to put together a curriculum for working with men um, as an alternative to, you know, jail time or whatever else that would happen to them if they got arrested. They wanted to give them a, a rehabilitation option. And they'd come up with an idea. They brought in a bunch of experts from around the country and they just said, you know, we really think you need to get more um, voices from women involved in what the content is. And so they sat down with over 200 women and uh, over the course of many months in conversations, asked them, um, if we get these guys into a group for how many weeks they, had, they didn't know at the time, what would you like us to, to talk about that would make your life better? And so the women started talking about all the different things that they were experiencing. Um, how, he, how he's controlling with the money, how he uses children against them, um, how he coerces them once he's, you know, kind of established himself as a threat to them and how he, how he gets his way with them um, without even having to raise his hand. Um, intimidation, all of that. So when they started getting all this stuff documented with the women, um, the word tactics came out and they kind of attached that word to these different um, uh, categories of abuse that women were, were all sharing uh, their experiences around. And one of the things when they started thinking about collectively how to put this into a graphic um, that represents their experience, that it was, it was important to the women that that physical and sexual violence hold those tactics together. Because, it, because for example, emotional abuse, which can happen to any of us um, in a relationship, really is in a different space um, with somebody who's, who's threatening to use or using physical and sexual violence um, against their intimate partner with the intent to dominate them. So, um, and what the women said is that when he, he's established himself as this threat and he's using these tactics, what he gets is power and control over us. Um, they didn't say he desired it. They said, that's what he gets. And so they said, we want him to know that this is what he's doing. We want you to talk to them about that. And then we want um, uh, you to talk to him about what the alternatives might be, which is then the equality wheel. One of the interesting things I think about the wheel, um, that what these women were naming is, and what we've learned since in the 40 some years since it was put together, working with cultures and communities around the world who've adapted the wheel is that these, these tactics that the women named are really the tactics of oppression. These are the tactics that, that uh, governments can use, um, people can use to oppress others. And 
men who batter, they didn't come up with these tactics. Um, they learned them because our culture is so efficient and good at teaching oppression and teaching otherness, um, a privilege. Um, and so this is, this is really a, a reflects the, the culturally um, constructed learned behavior that men execute against their female partners. And this is a window into both the lives um, that, they, that, that uh, women live and what um, their male partners are doing to them. So this wheel is gender specific in that way. Um, this is men's violence against women. This is not a generic wheel for all domestic violence cases. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and let others join in. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Melissa and Lori, this question is directed for both of you uh, in your work. And women experience the dynamics on the power and control wheel on both a micro level within their homes and in their relationships, but also on that macro level at work and in civic like life, including interacting with racist and misogynistic economic and political systems. What is so striking about gender-based violence is the intentionality of the violence, the isolation and economic control. And it's no accident that these things happen. I'm gonna direct this question first to Lori. Lori, can you please talk more about how this plays out in daily life for women and why is it so important to center the lived experiences of survivors? And you're on mute, Lori. Thank you. Um, what I think I can best speak to here, like you said, is um, uh, my personal experience with the power and control wheel and what I know um, through advocacy, what other women you know, how other women have talked about it and what they've expressed to me about, about it. So um, I remember about 18 years ago, a close friend who I still consider to be one of the most honest people that I've ever known came to me and said, you know, Lori, I think your partner has a lot of control over you. Um, she gave me these examples of things she had observed and that made her think this and I, I just simply didn't accept it. Um, Later that evening, after I had the conversation with my friend, I told my partner about it and we had a good laugh at my friend's expense. Um, her intentions were honest and caring um, because I had not recognized for myself or had labeled for myself what was going on. I was in a position to either accept or reject what she had said and I chose to reject it at that time. Um, the example she gave was really inconsequential to me at the time based on all the other behaviors that my partner was dishing out. Um, so I just brushed off what she said. Um, and it was also at that time in my best interest to do so. But then about six months later, um, after this friend had and I had had this experience, I had the opportunity to be introduced to the power and control wheel, um, which was a whole different experience for me. Um, I read what I now know to be the tactics, you know, using um, coercion and threats, using intimidation and so on. And um, I could see my life in this image. And so for that, for that, for me is like the micro level perspective of how women can be impacted, that they can um, see their own lives in this image. And it, for me, it also led me to ask a lot of internal questions and questions about the world around me. Um, a few months down the road from being introduced to the power and control wheel, I was then in a group of women who had experienced domestic violence and we were all sharing how we had experienced various forms of coercion and threats and things like that. Um, it was um, really powerful for me to hear the similarities between what my partner did to me and what their partners were doing to them and the things that we were doing in response to that. Um, I just remember being stunned by everything I was hearing around me. And so this for me is an example of how women experience the power and control wheel on a meso level. 
Um, and then at some point after that, I learned, maybe it was like six months, I learned about how the wheel was created. And um, just like Scott had shared, I, I learned some of that information. And I realized because of that, that people all over the country were organizing to reduce and end domestic violence. And I was shocked. I mean, I was like, you mean there are people in like Arizona that are organized to try to help women deal with this issue? Like it blew my mind. So, um, you know, and to learn that people all over the world uh, were using some version of the wheel was amazing. And it was also, you know, like a macro level perspective on violence against women, um, you know, that, to know that it's perpetrated everywhere and that by design, it's made to be invisible and it's designed to make women feel powerless and broken and to be isolated. Um, so part of what I've learned from the power and control wheel and how it relates to women on a micro, meso and macro level has helped me and other women to depersonalize the violence we're experiencing. Um, it has helped us put into perspective that our partners would be acting this way with potentially any woman that they're with, and that it's not about us really as just individual women who deserve um, this kind of behavior. Um, it's also helped me to recognize um, that this that my partner's use of physical and sexual violence um, serves a purpose. It's not random. It can be used randomly, but ultimately it serves a purpose. And um, knowing the power and control wheel, seeing my life in it has also helped me to see that my life could be free of violence. And um, it also helped me to let go of some of the shame that I was carrying. Um, so for countless women, the power control wheels, um, ability to name the nameless and to organize what feels like chaos is priceless to us. And so I'm so grateful to all the women who contributed to its creation and to all the people that, um, you know, organized and collaborated and brought women's lives, um, this part of women's lives, um, out of the darkness and into the light. Um, so th those are my thoughts on it. Thank you so much for that, Lori. And I can tell you, you know, as an attorney who's represented hundreds of women, when I show them the power and control wheel, that, that same moment that you had where, wow, um, you know, that it's, it's a strong visual. And uh, thank you so much for that. Melissa, you also work with men who abuse and batter. Can you share the equality wheel and talk about what it takes to change someone's perspective about relationship equality? Yeah, thanks, uh, Lori. Uh, Sophia's putting this up on the screen. And one of the things, a couple things to know about the equality wheel, and Scott also has it behind him so you can kind of see that if you take the equality wheel and you set it on top of the power and control wheel, it was designed in terms of being the opposite sort of tactic or, um, you know, experience. So let's just take respect, which you see here. The opposite of that on the power and control wheel is emotional abuse. So part of what needed to happen was to, to not just think about what is it that men were doing, but what is it that um, you know, we're sort of going for in terms of relationship and asking women, you know, what would a relationship based in equality, based in nonviolence look like? And what would all the different sort of aspects of that be and differently than what's on the power and control wheel? Um, I'm going to put into the chat right now, I just uh, copied and pasted. Uh, I've been doing men's group for 23 years now, and I did group yesterday. And i am just shared a few of the beliefs that came out um, from men's group yesterday. So what I wrote in the chat, for those of you who can't see that, who are on, on mine or on Facebook, is one of the men said yesterday that he justified his violence because she needs to hear me or she makes me evil. Another man said, I deserve to get my way with her. Another man said, she's a lesser person. And another man said, well, I'm just smarter than her. So I share these with you because... I want the audience to get a sense of, 
it's not just about adopting this, right? A lot of people can say that intellectually, right? Which is that, yeah, I respect her. I want to respect her. I'm going to respect her, for example. But it's a big thing for men to give up the thinking, right? And then think about what's the thinking I'd have to have that would be different than what I have now. So just to take one of those examples that I mentioned, and one of them is she needs to hear me. So this guy said, when I speak, right? And he was a guy who yelled a lot. He talked about keeping her up all night, kind of like having to, you know, prove her point so she would think the same way. And that's a, an example of that a lot of the men, you know, there's a lot of discussion in this work about do these groups work or not. The men actually don't have to give up the thinking that they have of when they come into group. Now we do a lot of work with them to help expose that sort of thing, but they also get a lot of support in society that's counter to what you see here, here on the equality wheel. We have plenty of examples, especially in, you know, in this current culture and political environment to see that these sort of values and beliefs in order to if you look under the respect one there, for example, listen to her non-judgmentally, being emotionally affirming and, and understanding and valuing her opinions. The, that last one, valuing her opinions, meaning that I actually want to know what she has to say. I actually value what she thinks. That's hard, not just for a lot of men in our group, but men in the culture <laughs> is uh, the experience of a lot of women as well. So this is not easy work, right? So a lot of our work, what we find is sort of intellectually what we have is that people say, yep, I want to be there. But being able to give up the thinking that's attached to power and control, a lot of men don't want to do. And we've had a number of men who have said things like, you know, I've changed this thinking. I've worked really hard to change that. But we had one guy say, you know, Melissa, I'm just smarter than her with money. And I just think I'm smarter than all women. I just, I walk around the world seeing women make stupid decisions with money, right? And he just said, I can't ever imagine living on this earth and thinking differently, right? So that's, that's an example for him about his thinking is how he's very, very attached to that. And so it's part of, um, I mentioned this because it's not easy right? It's not easy for all of us who try and work on ourselves doing this work as well to have this equality-based thinking and the belief system to support it all the time. Thank you so much for that, Melissa. I want to go ahead and turn to you, Lester. So, Yulester, the tactics of oppression that the batter has learned reflected in the power and control wheel is also deep in our justice system. For example, systems of justice are based on coercive treatment that are designed to provide consequence to people uh, to make them change their behavior, which doesn't work very well. What should be changed in terms of the particular ways it is manifested in the system and working with men? As a way to, to, to get to that question, I want to start first by acknowledging or uh, naming my, my appreciation for, for this wheel. I learned a lot today already about it. There's a lot I didn't know. I've been using it for over 30 years and I just learned some extra stuff. I mean, this is what a contribution, what a gift these women have given us. Right, what a powerful instrument, tool, to really um, help us in, in the work that we're doing. So I just wanted to start this. So appreciate and Laurie, Stabin, Stabin, as you're sharing, and, and uh, Melissa as well, Scott, and all of the other folks who have made possible this amazing wheel, wheels. So um, I want to start with, as a way to answer that question, by sharing one of my favorite quote, quotes by Audre Lorde. She said, you know, the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house, right? I want, I want to say that again. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So as already acknowledged, 
the judicial system in so many ways, um, we see enacted all those tactics from the power and, and, and control wheel. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind, as, as I imagine it's true for many, that that system was constructed with the master's tools. And so it's still perverse to me that, that any, any one of us will continue to look or we look to that system for justice, right? Uh, I get why we participate and engage the system. I certainly have. I think it's important to really underscore that it's to me, again, unrealistic to expect certainly for women and people of color and other marginalized communities to really um, you know, get any justice there. Uh, and so even also when we think about intervention program, I've heard, well, you know, where am I going to get um, referrals if I don't work, work with the court? So I you know I, when I used to work uh, at, at an organization here in Atlanta, Metro Area called Men Stopping Violence, approximately 50% of the men who came to a program were not coming through the courts. And I think in part because we did a lot of collaboration and organizing the community to encourage faith communities, for example, to send men to our program and other such systems and institutions. And I think that is the ideal, is to really imagine doing this work without a codependent relationship with the, 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 the judicial um, um, systems. And we know Women of color leadership, particularly I'm thinking right now about insight as one example, has offered us blueprints and practices about what that can look like. We know the work, for example, of Mimi um, Kim's out of Cal State University. Um, I think I've got the uni university right. You know, Beth Ritchie um, out of the uni University of Chicago, Illinois, and Andrea Smith, and uh, many of these women who have written scholars, you know, scholarly articles and actual practices about what an engagement with community outside of the judicial, judicial system, you know, can, you know, can look like. So that is um, an appeal rather than look into the system about with any realistic expectation for change, we change in our expectation and make possible the kind of engagement with communities that I think would allow for, you know, safety and justice um, for women. Ultimately, we have to approach this work with a high deal of respect. And there goes the respect wheel as well, right? Often another about what that can look like for all of the communities work with, including the men, um, you know, in, 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 in our programs. And last comment, it matters even with such powerful instruments to remind ourselves that any really, really significant change it's gonna to have to come from the systems and institutions around us. We have to always look at this wheel, the wheels, the work we do, do in groups, you know, um, or in, uh, in other, whatever other setting to put it in context. And that the expectation ultimately is that if we are going, again, to repeat, if we're gonna to have to get any real drastic, significant changes, it has to be at the cultural level that those systems would have to change. That is what you know. Um, I I want to emphasize. Thank you, Lester. And and so I want to now open up the the meeting for questions from our participants. And uh, there was one question from uh, from a participant that Scott Miller. Um, answered, but the question is, does the power and control wheel also apply to male survivors? And Scott, you explained that it does not, um, that this is a generic wheel. Would you like to expound a little bit on that and, and that thought behind that? Yeah, so the power and control wheel often gets used by people inappropriately as a representation of everybody's experience of domestic assault, um, and it's not. Um, it was women talking about their male partners and what they were doing to beat them into submission, um, to oppress them, okay? And what people do is they take the word domestic violence and they think that any domestic violence then fits into this wheel. It doesn't. 
So if a, if, a, if a woman finds her partner has cheated on, on her and she confronts him and he denies it and she slaps him across the face, that has nothing to do with this wheel. That's domestic violence, but it's not battering. It's not oppression, right? Um, and that's what this wheel represents is somebody who is oppressing another, their, their, their intimate partner um, and the tactics that they used to do that. Um, now, there are, instead of, and we get this, and I just answered this question yesterday for, for somebody, um, there's suggesting that, that, you know, we make it gender neutral so everybody, it applies to everybody, yeah. but it doesn't, right? Um, and so uh, we, instead, what we do is we partner with different communities who want to make adaptations to it um, so that the, how these tactics get used in their communities is represented in a wheel. So um, when working with, with men who uh, in the evangelical faith tradition, the power and control wheel, the tactics are the same, but how they justify them, how they leverage them, how they use them are different, right? Um, men in same-sex relationships, uh, the wheel that uh, was developed in Melbourne, Australia, um, again, tactics are virtually the same, but how they get used within that community is very different, right? And so what we are suggesting is that there are more wheels, not one wheel um, to represent everybody so that there's um, uh, cultural specificity to the wheel so that people who in that community can look at it and say, all right, as Lori did, I see my life reflected in that, given how those tactics in the military, they, you know, when they adapted the wheel, the, the, how somebody in the military intimidates, right, or coerces, they have leverages that the average civilian doesn't have against their intimate partner. That, that's, that's what helps us get another lens into somebody else's experience. Um, but the one thing that, that is just stunning to us, and I'll give you an example that's not even around domestic violence. This is women in political office, elected political office in, in uh, Alberta, Canada. They interviewed women to find out what were all the ways in which their male colleagues or constituents mm. were oppressing them because they were elected. And it turned out that all the same tactics on the power and control wheel, yeah. were, including using their own children to send messages home of threats to them. Um, so uh, these are the tactics of oppression. And so when we're not talking about domestic violence, we're talking about oppression in which domestic violence is the component in, in <clears throat> how it gets exercised. So yeah, if that helps um, kind of give context, more context to what we've been talking about. Scott, a quick note. I, I imagine, again, you and Melissa have been dealing with this quite a bit to your point about, can't we make it gender neutral? Isn't it just stunning? May, well, Stunning may not be the right word. Just any experiences that centers women, the discomfort with it. It's like, how dare they be at the center, right? Can we just make it gender neutral, you know, so that we can't have that? that you know, it, it's, 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 it's just worth naming, man. Yeah, we can. Then it's oppression. No, let's make it domestic violence. It is so troubling. So I'm really glad you continue to really name that and hold the line on that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think the same thing, you know, like as someone, and Lori does this work as well with us at Global Rights for Women, working with women who use violence, is that, you know, we've done a lot of work, we've done, a, there's a lot of research in the field about when in heterosexual intimate partner relationships, women use violence, it's mostly to resist all of these tactics in heterosexual relationships. And so the part of why there's not a wheel, right, that shows us an intimate partner heterosexual relationships is because there, it, there's not a, an experience of oppression, right? Because it's, it's the oppression that's represented in the wheel and it's the resistance that women are using overall. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that wheel is absent because that's, those aren't generally the tactics that women are using in intimate partner heterosexual violence they're just really working hard to to resist it and and I remember a woman recently said 
said, it's almost like it's my full-time job <laughs> to resist his oppression. Like every day, what am I going to have to do today, right? To navigate around, resist, hide, combat, you know, what I have to experience with him. And this is a woman who wasn't living with him anymore, right? And she was still having to do this. She shared children with him. And she said, it literally felt like, she said, I, she had just applied for a job. And she said, I had this funny little thought in my head. Uh, resisting my partner. That's another one of my jobs that I don't get paid for because I spend so much of my energy working to resist him. Yeah. I'm really glad that she shared that and that you shared it with us because I just really feel that. And I was thinking about like one of the tactics that I would use the most to resist. Like, so if you were going to make a power and control wheel out of like the things that I did to resist the oppression, it would be, you would see the word whatever, because, mm -hmm. you know, it was really like, that is a word that he hated for me to use. So I used it as often as I could, I would just say whatever, you know, and it, it drove him crazy. It was, that was the tool that I had, you know, I couldn't, um, <laughs> I couldn't do a lot of other things. I didn't have the power, the ability to do them. Um, and then I like that you brought up that she said it was like this full-time job and she wasn't even with him anymore, which makes me think about how people assume, or maybe, maybe they really haven't reflected on it much, but that when women leave that somehow now this power and control wheel is like, it's gone from their lives. Oh, look now, now it's not a thing here. It is, it's, it, it's, it can be with them in a different form for years and years and years, especially mm -hmm. if they have children. And that's why we have, you know, the, the post separation wheel. I remember thinking like, okay, so now I went from this, I want what's on the equality wheel, but in some ways I'm always going to be dealing with the stuff on the post separation wheel. And then, you know, so it just like continued for a long time in a different version. Lori, can you expand on that a little bit? There's a, a question, you know, talking specifically about victim blaming. You know, why doesn't she just leave? You know, why is she staying in this relationship? Uh, and, and often, you know, we see this victim blaming in our society. And so then what are some of those barriers that, that we as a system or, you know, um, advocates or participants in this work what can we do to change uh, some of those barriers? Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I think the thing that I think about is how that woman said it was her full-time job. And I think about how from my experience that um, it, it, that's a great way to describe what was going on there. And um, that I had had, by the time it was done, I had used every resource that I possibly could had at my disposal to, to try to make it better. Just everything I could possibly do to make it work. Um, so I think for some women, it, it just hasn't, it's not at that point, you know? Um, I don't know. Um, that's just the first thing I think yeah. of. And I think Lori, like to just, you know, add to what you're saying is, and his version of making it work, right, is different yeah. than yours, right? Like his version is you're going to listen to everything he says. Yeah, it's going right? to, it's going to be to tolerate all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's going to be his um, version yeah. of it for sure. Yeah. But maybe Lori, just say a little bit about, you know, your leaving process. Do you have mm. some thoughts about that? I think the question's asking a little bit about, you know. Oh, I, a lot of the general public wants to understand, you know, when women lead, why they don't and that sort of thing. Can you put any words to that? Well, when I wasn't leaving, it was because I had not done every single thing I could possibly do yet. And I think okay. for me, it was also when I realized, oh, this is it. When I realized that he was never, never going to stop asking me to be different in order for it to work, that that was never going to end. He had the bar and he would just keep moving it and moving it, moving it, moving it. And I would always be for the rest of my life having to adapt 
and adjust myself physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually, spiritually to, to be in this relationship. Like when I realized that, then, then I had moments where I'm like, that's it. Now I have to deal with the death of this thing that I've given everything to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful to understand. Melissa, one of the other questions that uh, is within the chat, you do a lot of work on risk assessments. What are some of the most dangerous behaviors people should be more aware of? And can you point to the power and control wheel as, as examples of that? Well, I mean, the power control wheel wasn't meant to be a, a risk assessment. You know, it's a, it's a visual graphic of women's experience of oppression. I mean, there's been a lot of research about, um, you know, what are some of the most, uh, what indicators are, are most likely to cause women harm. And, they, and some of those, of course, show up on the power and control wheel, like on the outside ring, sexual violence. We know that sexual violence, if a woman is experiencing that in particular, there's a lot of data that shows that's, that's one of the top five sort of lethal indicators in terms of violence. You know, threats to harm or kill, and the woman believes it, you know, that he's capable of it. That's another one. But I think one of the ones that gets missed sort of overall, and Evan Stark talks a lot about this in his research. Now he calls it coercive control as a terminology, but you know, women who experience a lot of these controlling tactics. So, and so we think about this in terms of frequency and severity. You know, how often is she experiencing this? How severe it is. And so coercive control, which are the tactics on the power and control wheel, are a really strong indicator of someone who is, you know, in a lot of danger because of what their abuser is doing to them. Lori, you're uh, muted. Uh, a question that came in. So how... It, and Scott, you um, you talked a little bit about this how, on how we have different wheels. And so uh, maybe that's answered a little bit, but how does this work then for same-sex couples? And, and can there be the same type of oppression within a same-sex couple? Uh, what kinds of tactics uh, do you see? Oh, it's the same tactics, right? Um, but, he, but he might... Uh... Uh, utilize his status within that community to marginalize his, his intimate partner. And which is, which is just another version of how somebody in a religious community who has status marginalizes their partner within the religious community, right? So, I mean, it's, 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 or how the military, how he marginalizes his partner who's also in the military within the ranks of the, so, uh, 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 that kind of um, tactic, that kind of uh, abuse um, is, is you just see it across the board. It just, there's a different way of leveraging it in any given community. And so if you go to our website, you'll see those wheels um, and the write-up that the um, people who put it together uh, 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 gave us to go along with the wheels so you can see it within context. Another thing on the um, uh, on the wheel uh, that was developed for uh, by survivors with uh, male survivors um, against their uh, male uh, abusers was that um, the culture of of uh, hatred of of gay, lesbian, trans um, uh, that cultural narrative that hatred of them. Uh, is on the outside of the physical violence, right? That holds that together. Um, that makes it easier for him to isolate um, his partner within that, within that um, cultural hatred. Um, and then on the equality wheel that they developed, it's just the opposite. Love for gay, lesbian, trans people um, would open up and make it more transparent. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when we do these, we just, uh, published a, uh, a wheel, and I, I just give you a quick 
notion about how this happens. If somebody wants to adapt our wheel, they don't get to just put it together by a bunch of experts. Um, if, they, if that's what they're going to do, then they can't put our name on it because they can make a wheel if they want, but they can't put our name on it because um, if they're going to adapt it, they have to go to the people that they're serving and ask them, what is their experience? How are those tactics used? Are those the tactics used? All of those questions have to be derived and they have to put that together in partnership with the people they serve. So every adaptation that's approved by us, that's how they were put together. Um, we just published one that was done in the Amish Plain community in Ohio. Mm. That's the first wheel that we, uh, uh, um, in working with the uh, uh, authors and the community that they were working with, uh, is that's gender neutral. And the, what was fascinating about their interviews with young men, uh, women, and the GLBTQ secret community within that community mm. was that all of them were being beaten for the same reason, gender enforcement. There is a gender that you were born with being a man, and we are going to beat it into you if you start to step out of it. So the women who are normally experiencing these tactics of abuse from their male partners, which was happening in that community, there were also men experiencing that within their community for the same reasons, right? Um, and so it's really a, an interesting window when people take this power and control wheel, bring it to a community of, of other folks and say, what, how does this resonate in our community? How is it being used? And then we, we help them promote that work. In fact, I'll just give a plug for next year, uh, Global Rights for Women is gonna have a series for uh, the people that have uh, developed new wheels. Mm. They're gonna highlight them um, and give them the, the a platform to talk about their work within their communities on adapting the power and control wheel. So look forward to that in 2023. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, go ahead, Neil Lester. Just a piece to add to that. Um, yes, you know, pretty much much of the, the, the tactics inside the, the wheel are used in, in same, you know, same gender relationship. And another way to think about it is that there are additional tactics inside the wheel. And much of those tactics are heterosexist behaviors and belief that a partner can use against their partner. And one of the classic ones, um, you know, we see in, in, in same gender relation is, is threat to out the partner. That is huge. You know, if the person is not out, need I say any more, right? So the, the partner can draw from all those sexist um, beliefs and attitudes and behaviors as a way to, to, to harm partners. So just wanted to add that piece. Yeah, and it's yeah. the dominant culture that creates all the hate that makes something, that tactic, exactly, right? exactly, right, yeah. I think the other thing just to add, Scott, is also what we found in the evangelical faith community when they asked to adapt, not just the power and control, but the equality wheel. They just said equality was something that they couldn't sort of uh, mm -hmm. look to <laughs> as sort of as being it inspiring. It was a tough <laughs> word for yeah. them based on their evangelical faith belief system. So what they ended up with was partnership. So they got permission to change the center of theirs as partnership. So it's not always just the tactics on the power and control side, but sometimes it's also that when they want to do some work on the, the other sort of wheel, it's changing what's sort of the goal in the center there. Well, and, and, and to build on that, the, the, um, when we're working with an indigenous community that's adapting the wheel, oftentimes they, uh, they will say that the power and control wheel um, we might just leave it as it is. Um, now there's an example that was put into the chat. That's a great example. In fact, Ellen um, kind of liked that version a little bit better than ours because um, the group that put that triangle together, that's more representative of hierarchy and privilege uh, and shape than ours is as a circle. But um, uh, often an indigenous community will say that the power and control wheel is colonization. That's what colonization looks like. Those are the tactics of colonization. And those that, that's the mindset that men have been, that have been imposed upon them through colonization. So what changes for them is the equality wheel because that then represents their traditional values and their culture, which they are uh, 
you know, hoping that the men can get back to away mm. from this, this nice. colonized mindset of uh, the power and control wheel. Mm. One of the questions from the chat is uh, directed to you, Lester. So you were talking a little bit about systems change. And what do you think are some of the most pressing system changes that you think would make a difference, um, you know, right away um, in, in the way that there's, there's thinking around um, how the systems are interacting with survivors? Uh, what do you think would make a difference? Yeah, I'm, 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 I can't wait for this, Elastro. Like, you know, and I'm, my, my brain is going all over. You the should place. have a list. <laughs> well, I hope other people are doing. I, 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 let's just start with one and again. You know, you know, Laurie and Melissa speak to this, but I just want to start here. I think it's a place to start. How about just listening to women? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, is, that's so radical. I mean. <laughs> that's i'll just i'll just offer that one right because yeah. keep in mind again i am not that optimistic about about systems change you, you heard that from my original comments right i don't look to the system and expect that they're going to you know really do what they're supposed to but i would offer that one as a start laurie is mm -hmm. just start listening to the folks who are, who, who, who who everybody matters i'm sorry but you said the folks who matter but just listen to to women that would be a, a way way to to start the work yeah and the interesting thing about that you is you'd think that would be easy you know and our work at global rights for women we we were part of evaluating a very large international project where 10 countries got um tasked with making some major policy changes and then we got to evaluate the process and i tell you not one of those countries took mm -hmm. the time to talk to survivors or women Kevin. before making huge systemic changes. It was fascinating to us, right? And I think the other piece of that is how <clears throat> much time they spent sort of justifying why they didn't yeah. um, as well. But, you know, and that's not even just globally, that's also here in the US. When you look at, you know, there's always all this discussion about curriculum as it relates to working with men and women. And the question I always ask is, did what's it based on right is it based on the lived experience of survivors or not because that's the starting place i think for me to understand its credibility in terms of its work right yeah i mean same thing with me as a as a uh, so i you know i think systems can change reform might be the, the word that i i'm less optimistic about but i think they can shift Right, but where they can reform, I don't know. Um, it, that's I, I have a hard time imagining what it actually would look like. Mm -hmm. But um, but the uh, uh, to Melissa's point and and Ulester's is that you know the foundation of the Duluth model method of organizing is to start with the lived experience of those experiencing the violence in a community. So people will call and they'll say, "Hey, what should we do in our CCR?" Well, mm -hmm. I can give you some overarching kind of ideas, but I don't actually know what's going to work because I haven't talked to the women in your community. Like that's where it starts. And they start saying, okay, so when you call for help from your pastor, from your community, from 911, yeah. what happens that's helpful? What happens that isn't? And then that becomes your agenda for, for what needs to get changed. But what tends to happen is that all the people who are experts get around a table yep. and talk yep. about what they think needs to happen. And, yep. and a lot of times when I track back those changes, yep. they're changes to make their lives better for yeah. the people they're serving, as opposed to make them change so that it's easier for the people they're serving to get in. <laughs> yeah, which is then efficiency becomes, right, the unspoken sort of central goal as opposed to what's you know better or more safe for women's lives you see a lot of efficiency changes basically right. let's let's just keep what is in place in place yeah you right. know we just we get really creative to make it look like something is really happening but not much is really happening right right well and then you get people that call and say <laughs> you know we've been meeting at this we've been having this is a real call we've been meeting for 23 years mm -hmm. and we want you to come, come be part of this because nothing changes. <laughs> well, that's because where's the, the women same... at that 
table. We're exactly, so busy in that right? meeting. Exactly. <laughs> I, I can assure you, do five focus groups, you will have years of work. <laughs> so to expound a little bit, and, and one last question. So we're talking a little bit about some of the ways that the wheel um, can be misused by those of us within uh, batter's intervention programming. Uh, what is most problematic um, ab about that? And, and, and what is the, you've expounded a little bit on that response, you know, listening to women or listening to, you know, the population uh, that is being oppressed, whether it's Native American women, whether it's uh, transgender, uh, you know, community. Talk a little bit more about that. Maybe um, Melissa, Lori, Scott, those who are working with batters intervention programs. Yeah, I mean, I would say, and Lester, you can talk about this too, just in terms of how people think about our work, you know, and I think it's the, the new, you know, becoming this gender neutral sort of thing that's happening throughout our field. And we've talked about in other sessions too, I think, which is about the role of doing trauma work, um, I think in these work, in this work as well. Um, you know, I just listening to the belief systems that I sort of hear in group sort of week after week after week, you know, um, if big work isn't done to change that. And when we take women's voices out of that wheel, I mean, I think for me, that's the thing that's most troubling is when people make the pound control um, gender neutral, they think they're just changing a piece of paper. But what they're actually doing is that those are women's voices, right, that are put and it's women's experiences. So they're really, it's a, just another version of silencing women um, is sort of my way that I describe it. All right, well, we have two minutes left and there's quite a bit of resources that, um, that we need to go ahead and put in the chat. And so I wanna make sure that, that all of the participants have an opportunity to review that information, uh, have access to that information, cut and paste, copy, things of that nature. And so I would like to go ahead and thank all of our guests today for talking with us. And I wanna thank our participants for being here, for asking such important and engaging questions. I would also like to thank my colleague, Sophia, and Pat for ensuring that this conversation went smoothly on the technological side. We've included links in the chat to learn more. And if you would like to support Global Rights for Women, your contribution goes to supporting the work of advocates around the world, centering survivor voices, as we've talked about here today, as the means to achieving systemic change. All participants are going to go ahead and receive an email in the next few days with these resources, as well as a link to the recording. So once again, thank you so much for being here. It was an absolute honor to share this space with all of you. And we'll go ahead and get all of these. Uh, there's quite a few links. We'll make sure that we get the resources for survivors in here um, as well for US survivors and international resources for survivors for international survivors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, see y'all. Thank you.